Chapter Eight of the Story of Ab. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine Blashford. The Story of Ab by Stanley Waterloo. Chapter Eight: Saber Tooth and Rhinoceros. The rhinoceros of the Stone Age was a monstrous creature, an animal varying in many respects from either species of the animal of the present day, though perhaps somewhat closely allied to the huge double-horned and now nearly extinct white rhinoceros of southern Africa. But the brute of the prehistoric age was a beast of greater size, and its skin, instead of being bare, was densely covered with a dingy-coloured, crinkly hair, almost a wool. It was something to be dreaded by most creatures, even in this time of great, fierce animals. It turned aside for nothing. It was the personification of courage and senseless ferocity when aroused. Rarely seeking a conflict, it avoided none. The huge mammoth, a more peaceful pachyderm, would ordinarily hesitate before barring its path, while even the cave tiger, fiercest and most dreaded of the carnivora of the time, though it might prey upon the young rhinoceros when opportunity occurred, never voluntarily attacked the full-grown animal. From that almost impervious shield of leather hide, an inch or more in thickness, protected further by the woolly covering, even the terrible strokes of the tiger's claws glanced off with but a trifling rending, while one single lucky upward heave of the twin horns upon the great snout would pierce and rend, as if it were a trifling obstacle, the body of any animal existing. The lifting power of that prodigious neck was something almost beyond conception. It was an awful engine of death when its opportunity chanced to come. On the other hand, the rhinoceros of this ancient world had but a limited range of vision, and was as dull-witted and dangerously impulsive as its African prototype of today. But short-sighted as it was, the boys clambering up the tree were near enough for the perception of the great beast which burst over the hummock, and it charged directly at them, the tree quivering when the shoulder of the monster struck it as it passed, though the boys, already in the branches, were in safety. Checking herself a little distance beyond, the rhinoceros mother returned, snorting fiercely, and began walking round and round the calf imprisoned in the pitfall. The boys comprehended perfectly the story of the night. The calf, once ensnared, the mother had sought in vain to rescue it, and finally, wearied with her exertion, had retired just over the little descent, there to wallow and rest while still keeping guard over her imprisoned young. The spectacle now, as she walked around the trap, was something which would have been pitiful to a later race of man. The beast would get down upon her knees and plough the dirt about the calf with her long horns. She would seek to get her snout beneath its body sidewise, and so lift it, though each effort was necessarily futile. There was no room for any leverage. The calf fitted the cavity. The boys clung to their perches in safety, but in perplexity. Hours passed, but the mother rhinoceros showed no inclination to depart. It was three o'clock in the afternoon when she went away to the wallow, returning once or twice to her young before descending the bank, and even when she had reached the marsh, snorting querulously for some time before settling down to rest. The boys waited until all was quiet in the marsh, and as a matter of prudence, for some time longer. They wanted to feel assured that the monster was asleep. Then quietly they slid down the tree trunk, and with noiseless step stole by the pitfall and toward the hillside. A few yards further on their pace changed to a run, which did not cease until they reached the forest and its refuge, nor even there did they linger for any length of time. Each started for his home, for their adventure had again assumed a quality which demanded the consideration of older heads and the assistance of older hands. It was agreed that they should again bring their fathers with them. By a fortunate coincidence, each knew where to find his parent on this particular day, and that they should meet as soon as possible. It was more than an hour later when the two fathers and two sons, the men armed with the best weapons they possessed, appeared upon the scene. So far as the watchers from the hillside could determine, all was quiet about the clump of trees in the vicinity of the pitfall. It was late in the afternoon now, and the men decided that the best course to pursue would be to steal down across the valley, kill the imprisoned calf, and then escape as soon as possible, leaving the mother to find her offspring dead, reasoning that she would then abandon it. Afterward the calf could be taken out, and there would be a feast of cavemen upon the tender food, and much benefit derived in utilization of the tough, yet not, at its age, too thick hide of the uncommon quarry. There was but one difficulty in the way of carrying out this enterprise. The wind was from the north, and blew from the hunters toward the river, and the rhinoceros, though lacking much range of vision, was as acute of scent as the grey wolves which sometimes strayed like shadows through the forest, or the hyenas which scented from afar the living or the dead. Still the venture was determined upon. The four descended the hill, the two boys in the rear, treading with the lightness of the tiger-cat, and went cautiously across the valley and toward the tree-trunk. Certainly no sound they made could have reached the ear of the monster wallowing below the bank, but the wind carried to its nostrils the message of their coming. 
They were not halfway across the valley when the rhinoceros floundered up to the level and charged wildly along the course of the wafted scent. There was a flight for the hillside, made none too soon, but yet in time for safety. Walking around in circles, snorting viciously, the great beast lingered in the vicinity for a time, then went back to its imprisoned calf, where it repeated the performance of earlier in the day, and finally retired again to its hidden resting place nearby. It was dusk now, and the shadows were deepening about the valley. The men, well up in the tree with the boys, were undetermined what to do. They might steal along to the eastward and approach the car from another direction, without disturbing the great brute by their scent, but it was becoming darker every moment, and the region was a dangerous one. In the valley and away from the trees they were at a disadvantage, and at night there were fearful things abroad. Still they decided to take the risk, and the four, following the crest of the slight hill, moved along its circle south-eastward toward the river-bank, each on the alert and each with watchful eyes scanning the forest depths to the left or the valley to the right. Suddenly one ear leapt back into the shadow, waved his hand to check the advance of those behind him, then pointed silently across the valley and toward the clump of trees. Not a hundred yards from the pitfall the high grass was swaying gently. Some creature was passing along toward the pitfall, and a thing of no slight size. Every eye of the quartet was strained now to learn what might be the interloper upon the scene. It was nearly dark, but the eyes of the cavemen, almost nocturnal in their adaptation as they were, distinguished a long dark body emerging from the reeds and circling curiously and cautiously around the pitfall. Nearer and nearer it approached the helpless prisoner, until perhaps twenty feet distant from it. Here the thing seemed to crouch and remain quiescent, but only for a little time, then resounded across the valley a screaming roar, so fierce and raucous and death-telling and terrifying that even the hardened hunters leapt with affright. At the same moment a dark object shot through the air and landed on the back of the creature in the shallow pit. The tiger was abroad. There was a wild bleat of terror and agony, a growl fiercer and shorter than the first hoarse cry of the tiger, and then for a moment silence, but only for a moment. Snorts, almost as terrible in their significance as the tiger's roar, came from the marsh's edge. A vast form loomed above the slight embankment, and there came the thunder of ponderous feet. The rhinoceros mother was charging the great tiger. There was a repetition of the fierce snorts with the wild rush of the rhinoceros, another roar, the sound of which re-echoed through the valley, and then could be dimly seen a black something flying through the air and alighting, apparently, upon the back of the charging monster. There was a confusion of forms and a confusion of terrifying sounds, the snarling roar of the great tiger and half-whistling bellow of the great pachyderm, but nothing could be seen distinctly. That a gigantic duel was in progress the cavemen knew, and knew as well that its scene was one upon which they could not venture. The clamour had not ended when the darkness became complete, and then each father, with his son, fled swiftly homeward. Early the next morning the four were together again at the same point of safety and advantage, and again the frost-covered valley was a sea of silver, this time unmarred by the criss-crosses of feeding or hunting animals. There was no sign of life, no creature of the forest or the plain was so daring as to venture soon upon the battlefield of the rhinoceros and the cave-tiger. Cautiously the cave-men and their sons made their way across the valley and approached the pitfall. What was revealed to them told in a moment the whole story. The half-devoured body of the rhinoceros calf was in the pit. It had been killed, no doubt, by the tiger's first fierce assault, its back broken by the first blow of the great forearm, or its vertebrae torn apart by the first grasp of the great jaws. There were signs of the conflict all about, but that it had not come to a deadly issue was apparent. Only by some accident could the rhinoceros have caught upon its horns the agile monster cat, and only by an accident even more remote could the tiger have reached a vital part of its huge enemy. There had been a long and weary battle, a mother creature fighting for her young, and the great flesh-eater fighting for his prey, but the combatants had assuredly separated without the death of either, and the bereaved rhinoceros, knowing her young one to be dead, had finally left the valley, while the tiger had returned to its prey and fed its fill. But there was much meat left. There were, in the estimation of the cave people, few more acceptable feasts than that obtainable from the flesh of a young rhinoceros. The first instinct of the two men was to work fiercely with their flint knives and cut out great lumps of meat from the body in the pit. Hardly had they begun their work when, as by common impulse, each clambered out from the depression suddenly, and there was a brief and earnest discussion. The cave-tiger, monarch of the time, was not a creature to abandon what he had slain until he had devoured it utterly. Gorged though he might be, he was undoubtedly in hiding within a comparatively short distance. He would return again inevitably. He might be lying sleeping in the nearest clump of bushes. It was possible that his appetite might come upon him soon again, and that he might appear at any moment. What chance, then, for the human beings who had ventured into his dining-room? 
There was but one sensible course to follow, and that was instant retreat. The four fled again to the hillside in the forest, carrying with them, however, the masses of flesh already severed from the body of the calf. There was food for a day or two for each family. And so ended the first woodland venture of these daring boys. For days the vicinity of the little valley was not sought by either man or youth, since the tiger might still be lurking near. When later the youths dared to visit the scene of their bold exploit, there were only bones in the pitfall they had made. The tiger had eaten its prey and had gone to other fields. In later autumn came a great flood down the valley, rising so high that the father of Oak and all his family were driven temporarily from their cave by the water's influx, and compelled to seek another habitation many miles away. Some time passed before the comrades met again. As for Ab, this exploit might be counted almost as the beginning of his manhood. His father, and fathers had even then a certain paternal pride, had come to recognize in a degree the vigor and daring of his son. The mother, of course, was even more appreciative, though to her firstborn she could give scant attention, as Ab had the small brother in the cave now, and the little sister who was still smaller but from this time the youth became a person of some importance. He grew rapidly, and the sinewy stripling developed, not increasing strength and stature and rounding brawn alone, for he had both ingenuity and persistency of purpose, qualities which made him rather an exception among the cave-boys of his age. End of chapter 8